This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us today. With me, as usual, is Richard Fields in the middle. And we got John Sparkles Cameron down there on the other end. <laughs> I, I couldn't help myself, John. I couldn't help myself. That's all right. That's all right. I'll, 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 you know, if people want to say I sparkle, I am fine with that. You have a sparkling personality. That's what we'll call it. Well, um, <laughs> that, that's that's fine by me. Yeah. Speaking of sparkling personalities, um, politics is beginning to infect something that I actually hold dear to my heart is uh, mental health advocacy. And there was an article out about how it needs to grapple with political and racial trauma. And I can't think of a worse thing to do to someone's mental health is to interact that with politics. We've just had a study, and I covered it on my podcast this weekend, um, that trigger warnings actually have no positive effect, and they may actually have a negative impact, which is no surprise to us. But how we can think that getting politics or more government involved in your mental health advocacy is going to increase your mental health is absolutely beyond me. Does anybody actually think that having bureaucracy get more involved in your in your mental health or having these advocates who push for more government involvement in your, in your life are actually involved in your mental health. It's well, you know, it, it reminds me of the Soviet Union uh, when uh, the uh, preferred treatment of, 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 of dissidents who they couldn't get for breaking any specific law was to throw them in the insane asylum, call them crazy and get them out of, get them out of the public square. Yeah, we didn't. We weren't that much better in the history, are we? We used to put gay people in in insane asylums because yeah, yeah. It, we didn't like to look at them. And so what we do, we lock them away. Hey, James, can you uh, I, I, can you enlighten me on the whole trigger point thing or trigger warning thing? Is that where if somebody does a certain behavior, then the cops are called? What what is that exactly? Well, the trigger warning is when you have like before you watch a movie. Sometimes they'll put in. Content viewer discretion advised. Yeah, the kind of content in front of a movie or in front of a TV show or in front of your biology class. You know, whatever it is, those trigger warnings that we may be covering topics that you find uncomfortable. Those trigger warnings they don't do any good, and and the reason is actually quite simple because it doesn't make you stronger. You you don't become. I have an anxiety disorder, and you don't conquer your anxiety disorder. What you do is you become stronger in the face of it. And if you have to walk around expecting the world to walk around on eggshells for you, you never become stronger. You actually weaken yourself that way. Hmm. And having this, I can understand the mindset of wanting to make people who have uh, mental health issues, their lives a little easier. But you have to be very careful that you don't make them, you don't infantilize them. You don't make them children. Because hmm. hmm. we're not children. We're human beings. We just have, we process information differently. And we need tools to help us navigate the world. We don't need the world to change. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've, we're heading down a wrong path. I can understand the mindset. I can understand how people can think they're helping, but they're not. And long-term interjecting politics in it is absolutely the worst thing to do. I think you can say that about pretty much any uh, subject. Uh, the more you interject politics in, what you're really doing is you are allowing a majority or the... Uh, uh, the elite or whoever is in charge of the political system, you're you're allowing them to make decisions for everybody. And uh, those decisions are more than likely not going to be right for everybody. And so you end up with a whole lot of uh, disenfranchised people, whatever the subject is, whether it's mental health or uh, any, any other uh, thing that has been medical, medical treatment, uh, banking, you name it, Every, everything has been politi politicized, has deterior deteriorated as a result. Hmm. Yeah, I, I have, you know, some family, um, my mother was schizophrenic, and um, fortunately she had, uh, she had the, the ability to, or the, the, she had access to um, being institutionalized. Um, she needed to be institutionalized. And um, she, you know, wasn't able to um, medicate properly when she was left her own devices. She, she would medicate with substances that didn't help her out, basically alcohol. If she would have been, you know, born three or four generations later, it would have been other substances. 
And fortunately, she had, you know, access to or we had access to, you know, a place to have her institutionalized. And it was painful to watch because, you know, it's, uh, you know, brain chemistry and, and you know, the fact that she did self-medicate for years and on and on and on. And I still don't think that the, the experts understand um, schizophrenia. I think one day they're going to find out it's like most things that destroy the world. It's a virus um, or some effect of a virus or something. But what, what galls me is that... The, the 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 powers that want, I'm not going to say the powers that be, the powers that we let be, um, instead of doing things to, to help those poor souls that are talking to themselves, there's probably one within a quarter of a mile where I live right now. I live right on the American River in Sacramento, uh, wandering through the trees, soiling themselves with no... Um, you know, they burned all their bridges, they've, they've used up all the familial help and all the rest of that. And these people um, need help. They need to either be helped by the community or they need to help by, by, by somebody. But instead of helping those people, and there's more and more and more of them all the time, they decide that, that, that the, the right thing to do is big brother so people's feelings are, are not hurt and take away their ability, like James said, to, to make their own choices and face these things and decide as adult human beings what they want to interact with. So, you know, if, if you're going to throw government money at something, throw government money at these poor, tortured souls that uh, we see on more and more street corners every day. Don't, don't you know, don't try to nanny state people who, who you know, simply need better tools and, and, and some coaching. Yeah. Um, Mental health is an individual thing, not a group thing. And so we can't paint this with such a broad brush. Mm -hmm. So we're going to move on. Painting with broad brushes, John, something else to kind of spark your interest. There was an article in Sacramento Bee, self-serving garbage. Wildfire experts are fighting over California forests, which about the actual proper way to respond to our forest problems. And uh, it's what do you have to say about them, John? Because this one's your wheelhouse today. Well, I, I hopefully you got some time. Um, so, you know, for years I've, I've been... Time's up. My, one of my favorite quotes is that uh, when John Muir first walked through, quote unquote, discovered the Sierra, he walked through it and talked about its inviting openness. And in 1905 uh, in this country, the National Forest Service set up a program to manage public lands. If these lands weren't per public if they're owned by people, which, you know, instead of owning all of us, it's a problem of the commons. Um, If they're owned by individuals, as are private forestry lands in the state of California, they'd be taken care of. And what what Native Americans did for literally thousands of years, maybe as long as 10,000 years, was to um, do the the process that foresters have trying to been uh, trying to have the Forest Service do in California for the last 50 years and are being stopped by some radical extremist environmentalists uh, who are on the fringe of forestry. And finally, the forestry experts are, are asking that these fringe nutcases get out of the way and, and let forestry practice that, that started with Native Americans burning undergrowth and thinning out forests so the big healthy trees could survive and provide great habitat for for game animals. We can't call it game anymore. It's not the Department of Fish and Game. It's Fish and Wildlife. But this process worked. And then in 1905, we created the Forest Service, and and it was going to suppress fires and then thin forests through managed logging. Well, what happened was this, of course, was perverted, as are all government programs, and we had some clear-cutting going which, uh, by the way, no loggers, no foresters, no forestry experts do anymore and haven't done for years and years because it's just a bad practice. It, it uh, destroys the crop. Um, so they do other things than clear cutting. So the, um, because of the clear cutting thing, the, the, the um, uh, fringe extremists stopped all uh, thinning of forests all prescribed burning. So what you had was you suppressed fires and then you didn't get rid of the fuel that 
uh, creates these massive forest fires we have now. There's 100, uh, two years ago, there was 130 million plus dead trees in the state of California. The bark beetle infestations we have are because of lack of fires. These raging mega fires we have are because the, the smaller fires that the Native Americans uh, used to do or lightning did um, um, were, were, were suppressed. And so now when these fires start, you can't stop them. So this, this lunatic, um, I, I don't know if, can I mention his name? Yeah, it was in the article, Dr. Hansen. I don't know if he's a doctor of. He's apparently an attorney, but doesn't practice. I came up with this brilliant idea that said that, that no, forest, thinning forest actually makes the fires work. What you want are thick forests because they provide a windbreak to protect the forest from the ravages of fire, which are wind driven. And the shade that these thick forests provide uh, cuts down on fires. Now, anybody with a lick of common sense would realize this is ludicrous. I mean, if you, if you have a little fire and surround it by matches to keep it from uh, the wind from hitting the fire, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have a bigger fire. But as usual in the environmental movement, the, these fringe people have the courts on their side. And so they've managed to stop thinning effort after thinning effort after thinning effort. And, and if, if I you know, hate to refer people to, to read a B article, in this case, they've done a pretty darn good job. Um, they give an example of where one, um, they, they had planned on uh, thinning in 1,000, I think it's about 10,000 acre parcel, parcel 9,000 acres in, in Klamath area. And, and they spent years and years and years getting this thing approved and then at the last minute, one of these fringe lunatic environmental organizations sued. The judge sided with them and stopped it And uh, before they could do it. And the whole thing burned to the ground in a fire. You know, you mentioned the uh, courts as being the villains. I'm not sure it's necessarily the courts. The courts are simply uh, enforcing the letter of the law. And the law is the EPA and the uh, environmental laws that were enacted under the Nixon administration. The Ruckels House, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, head of uh, environmental uh, activities under Nixon. He's the guy that brought in the EPA, the uh, Endangered Species Act, and all the rest of the uh, laws that if interpreted to the letter, as the courts are required to do, uh, ends up um, making it really, really easy for anybody who objects to any kind of development, any kind of uh, logging, any kind of activity at all. Anybody, uh, any any squeaky wheel can simply uh, say, "Well, there's a there's a spotted owl, or there's a, a woodchuck, or there's some other endangered species there. You can't do anything on that land." Or they can say any number of things that will tie uh, any kind of good, uh, sensible forestry up in knots for decades. That's mm -hmm. why, and during those decades, the forest continues to grow, the undergrowth continues to grow, adding fuel to the fire that will eventually come. Fires mm -hmm. always uh, come eventually, especially if there's a whole lot of fuel there. And that's mm -hmm. that's the, uh, the sad situation that we have uh, in California forests, and it's not going to go away until we, until either the, the fuel is burned or until we have sensible uh, forestry practices, basically, which could be, which could be uh, put into place really quickly if we simply uh, tell the Forest Service and all of the rest of the owners of uh, forests in California to get the heck out of the way, auction off the forest land, let private owners own it, let them manage it for the benefit of game for the benefit of selling timber uh, for their own uh, financial interest, they're going to manage it in a way that their property doesn't burn up. That's uh, the way that you get rid of the tragedy of the commons. That's the way that you get rid of the control being exercised by lunatic uh, environmentalists on the, on, the, on the far left uh, and NIMBYs on the far left or right who are trying to use environmental laws to get their own way, regardless of the uh, rights of the people who actually own the land. And in the case of uh, the forest in California, it's the American people that own the land. And it's, it's a very, very, very obvious tragedy of the commons. Mm. And there's, there's something you brought up something, Richard. There's a couple of things that, that 
um, you know, the, the, the spotted owl is used constantly as a, uh, a means to stop logging projects because they look at, at this area that's densely, you know, grown over by, uh, you know, lack of fires for, for, you know, since 1905 in some cases and maybe even before that. And they call that prime, um, uh, what, what, prime no, habitat that. spotted owl. Well, you know, the problem with that is, is, is that, that that isn't natural habitat for the spotted owl. It's man-created habitat for the spotted owl. Because if men weren't in the way, then um, you, you know, those forests would have burned and cleared out. And that would be the habitat for the spotted owl. But every time they, they start to try to do one of these uh, thinning projects, they discover that, um, oh, you can't do it over there because because there's a spotted owl population. Oh, wait, we discovered another spotted owl population over here. Oh, wait, the spotted owl is way more widespread than we thought, so you can't thin this because it's protected. Spotted owls over here as well. So the, my conclusion is that there's a way more spotted owls than anybody ever thought there was. Why are they on the endangered species list in the first place? And there is a bit of good news in this, and I know we need to move on to other subjects. There are some very bright attorneys out there uh, who are, or you know, if 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 it doesn't matter what the environmental law is, if something is a public nuisance and an endangerment to the citizenry, a judge can simply say abate that public nuisance. And if you're um, a, a a citizen of uh, or live in the Reading area or any of these other places that were evacuated because the nearby forest fires uh, have basically been turned into tinder boxes by government inactivity. If a judge says public nuisance, you have 120 days to fix it for a service. It doesn't matter what the environmental laws say. It doesn't matter what lawsuits are brought by these fringe groups or anything else. For the safety of the people in the city of Reading, these forests will be thinned. And so there is hope out there that I don't think there's any hope that we're going to get rid of in our lifetimes the EPA or all the rest of that stuff or these great boondoggle organizations that have assumed unconstitutional control. But I think there is hope that um, a judge is going to file a public or accept a public nuisance lawsuit and say, clean that forest out before it kills 10,000 people. I think there's some hope out there. Well, speaking about uh, hope and throwing gasoline on a fire, um, the Pennsylvania School Boards Association has decided to leave the National School Boards Association because they called parents domestic terrorists. And, you know, it's an interesting thing that we now have on one side, we've got environmental activists and other activists, you know, interjecting them, continually interjecting themselves in public policy. But when parents want to go and interject themselves in public policy at a school board meeting, which is a place they're supposed to do it, but if they get a little loud, then all of a sudden now you're a domestic terrorist. You can burn down a city, inner city and you're fine, but you go to a school board and get, and get a little angry and now you're a domestic terrorist. And, you know, all I can say is I'm actually now glad that this Garland did not become a member of the Supreme Court, because if this kind of attitude had been on the Supreme Court, we're all in trouble. Thank God for small favors. And yeah. really what this uh, really c comes down to, in the name of political correctness, in the name of uh, canceling anybody that doesn't agree with you, what's happening is the FBI has been enlisted to uh, stifle free speech and freedom of assembly and, and uh, uh, you know, the essentially the First Amendment and all the things it stands for. Uh, and uh, if, if it's allowed to go on, good luck with the rest of the Ten Amendments. Absolutely. And, and the, yeah, the idea that the FBI is actually, uh, you know, starting to keep track of these people is not surprising. The FBI is keeping track of everything because they're the government and despite all the lawsuits and everything else saying don't track people and, you know, don't look at their emails and don't put them on lists. They keep doing it. Uh, once again, you know, it, uh, another example of why we want a whole lot less government than we have rather than more. Yeah, yeah it's just, it's, it's almost unconscionable that the government would even think about, 
you know, these people who come on and they talk about protecting democracy, these are the same people who claim they're protecting democracy, are then when your most basic level of democracy, when people interact at the most basic level of democracy, which is your school board, your school boards, your water boards, it's not even your city councils, it's the lower boards. These are the places that the, your chance to actually have direct impact, and not only have they taken that ability to have direct impact away with mandates and political mandates from above, either curriculum or healthcare mandates, now they're taking it, your ability away to actually even just go express yourself and express your displeasure. And yeah, I don't I, know. It's interesting that the issues that it is happening on are uh, critical race theory, which uh, has a whole lot of issues, which I'm not going to go into, and uh, whether or not you know COVID policies uh, on at the at the school level, and people can have honest disagreements about either of those things without being racist and without being anti-scientific, and they're essentially being shut down uh, by the federal government, and that's unconscionable. Hmm. And I, I, I know we get in trouble uh, talking about COVID. Um, so uh, all I can say is I'd ask our viewers to look at, at uh, what other nations are doing with their kids. Um, our, our own uh, um, CDC, I believe, I could be wrong, this is a belief, not a statement, that said that, uh, um, you know, that their studies indicated that, that, you know, from look, well, let's go to foreign governments. Let me not even go there. Many foreign governments, uh, as who have as good a hospital systems as we do, and and are advanced medically as we are, and maybe even further, have have looked at the situation, and decide that kids don't need to be masked, and they don't need to be vaccinated, and and um, we here have decided that they do need to be masked, and we need them to get them vaccinated. So I think it is perfectly reasonable under any system of government that a parent could say why are these have why are these other countries having their schools open for literally six months or a year before ours and these kids can see each other's faces especially special needs kids like autistic kids who need all of their senses in order to communicate if they can while we somehow have to do a different road and i think the fact that 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 kind of conversation is shut down is uh you know, parents have a right to um, have a say in how their kids are educated and how they're treated in a school that is paid for with their taxes. Or to take the uh, public funds that they that are being spent supposedly on their behalf, take them out of the system and go to private school or homeschool. That would be the other solution. Well, I would, I would, I would love to see you know voucher systems in place in every school in the country. And this foolishness would be over in about six weeks, if that were the case. Yeah, yeah I think what we've seen here in the last what two years now is that our politicians don't actually ex um, explore the consequences of their action. They have yeah. emotional. Yeah, you say they don't reaction. explore. That's those. Are, that's the naive politicians. More of a, a more cynical viewpoint is they've explored them fully and they realize exactly what they're doing, uh, which is amassing more power for themselves and in the process enriching themselves and that's that's uh i know that's cynical but i think that's probably uh the truth for a whole lot of the elites that work them way work their way into uh, positions of government power well and I, despite being labeled uh, mr sparkle today john sparkle uh cameron i will agree with richard's cynical viewpoint i think anybody that looks at uh politics for you know 20 or 30 years and doesn't come to that conclusion is quite frankly a fool. Well, there's some evidence to this. The The leader of the SEIU and her husband have been arrested on embezzlement and tax fraud charges. So they've been stealing money from the union and then lying about it on their taxes. Well, they got taxes, Al, taxes got Al Capone. So if you're an SEIU leader, you know, they're not much different than Al Capone, I suppose, but you're going to get caught with taxes. The IRS likes their money and they don't care who they're going to get it from. <laughs> and wasn't, so, I, wasn't this franchise tax board? So, if they lie to the franchise tax board because the California taxes are based, you know, or they're intertwined with federal taxes, franchise tax board is bad enough to have on your bad bad side. But pretty soon, the IRS is going to they're going to be yeah. Those yeah. two organizations together, I would rather have the mafia after me than those two organizations. <laughs> 
you could the, ma the mafia will let you continue to earn a living as long as you pay them you pay them the uh, yeah. required rate of extortion. The IRS could care less whether you can earn a living. Well, and, and the mafia would protect me from the tongs and, <laughs> and the other hoodlum groups. Whereas, never mind. We we yeah, I I really don't want to get on their bad side. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you don't want to get on the bad side of the mafia or the IRS or the tax collectors because there's, you know, the greediest people in the history are the tax collectors. We all think that, you know, we all think that uh, Robin Hood stole from the rich and gave to the poor, but he did not. He stole from the tax collector and gave it back to the people. That's that's what he actually did. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't this notion that, you know, the tax from the rich and gave to the poor. No, the rich, in the case of Robin Hood, were the tax collectors was the, you know, the sheriff of Nottingham. It, it wasn't the average person. It wasn't some guy who sold too many, you know, lunches and sold too many sandwiches and became a millionaire because he sold lots of sandwiches. That's not what they were stole, took him money from. He took money from the tax collector and gave it back to the people. And what we are seeing here is repeatedly that our political systems are corrupting our social systems. We are now having political decisions being put into our... Uh, everyday decisions and it's it's degrading our culture i i think is what we are seeing absolutely Almost. yeah I, i'm i'm actually shocked that that we're seeing less stories of of corruption i i would assume being the cynic that i am uh that uh that some of those stories are are being suppressed uh, after the fact i don't think people are smart witness enough. witness hunter biden yeah well you know that that's talk about unconscionable that you know the the free pass that that uh that weekend at bernie's and his son have gotten you know from the lamestream press and the the uh stories made up of whole cloth about the the other fellow the, the twitter man who i don't even like uh, but you know you, you shouldn't just be allowed to make stuff up if you're an fbi agent uh and then and then um you know, and then apologize for doing it. Um, anyway, we're, we're getting off track. I know we're short on time. So, James, do you have anything else you want to cover in the last few minutes? Or Well, we got about a minute left. And, you know, it's – I just want to express that we've watched – we're watching politics continually invade more and more of our lives. And this question, this comment keeps coming up every time we turn. How did this COVID become politicized? How did this other become politicized? But I have to remind people that – you know, when politicians enact policies that need policing, you've politicized it automatically. I mean, they all share the same root word, polis. All of those are from the same root Latin. And so if you want to understand why our world is politicized, it's actually quite simple. It's as the government and our politicians interject themselves more and more in our daily lives, our daily lives are going to become more and more politicized. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, is that what we really want out of our lives? Well, I think the, the more fundamental question is this. You have to ask whether or not it's important enough to have other people uh, follow your point of view to uh, allow issues to be cited, decided by government or whether you can live with other people's differing opinions on how to run their own lives so that they'll leave you alone as well. And we are going to have, John, we're going to have to leave it at that. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Richard, John, for being here. And from, from Team Counterpoint, please remember to love everybody.